it's a spoof, but it's telling the truth. Because a lot of people think the church is just about them, and that's not what it is. Uh, pastor John, our discipleship pastor, and I were talking today, and I used to teach spiritual disciplines at seminary. I used to be an adjunct professor at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Kansas City, and I taught spiritual disciplines. There's a book by Don Whitney called Spiritual Disciplines, and it's about Bible intake and prayer and, and uh, fasting and service and witnessing and all the things that you would do to spiritually be disciplined. And we were, we were talking about that, and I said, well, I really like this other book better because it's about spiritual disciplines within the context of community. You see, if we're going to grow in Christianity, it's not going to be because we're spiritual monks. It's not going to be because we're on a mountaintop somewhere going, hmm, kumbaya. No, it's going to be because we're in a church and we're interacting with people who we rub the wrong way and who rub us the wrong way. It's where we can express love and forgiveness and we can minister to others where we can demonstrate what the love of Jesus looks like. That's how we grow spiritually. But we're not going to know how to do that by osmosis. I tell people, you're not going to be a Christian by going to a church any more than you're going to be a car by going to a garage. It doesn't just magically happen. You have to grow into maturity. So the Scripture tells us that Scripture itself is absolutely necessary for us to become effective disciples and effective as we minister, as we allow the Holy Spirit of God to work His gifts through us in the local church. So I want you to look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is inspired. That's that God-breathed inspired by God, and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. God has given us His Word in order to equip you and me for the task He has assigned us to. Listen, if you don't learn anything else tonight, remember this. God does not call the equipped, He equips the called. God does not call the equipped, He equips the called. That's why people say, well, I can't teach, I can't serve, I can't witness, I don't have a seminary degree. Listen, God doesn't need you to be extremely educated. He just needs you to be willing. He just needs you to be a willing vessel that He can fill up. When you make yourself available to Him, He will equip you, He will send somebody along to teach you. What happened to the Ethiopian eunuch? He was willing, he was reading the Word of God, and Philip, God takes Philip out of a a revival and sends him to the desert to one man because here was a man who was willing to give his life to Jesus. He was willing to follow Jesus, but he didn't know how. So what did God do? God says, I'm going to equip the called. I've called this man. So he picks up Philip instantly. It's a miracle in the New Testament. And he comes out of this revival and poof, he's in the desert. (laughs) Dude, (laughs) can you imagine that? And it's kind of like I dream a genie. (laughs) What am I doing here? And he sees this Ethiopian eunuch and he's reading. He says, I don't understand what I'm reading. He said, what are you reading? He goes, I'm reading Isaiah, but I don't understand it. God sent someone to teach him, to show him. The Macedonian call. God sent someone to share the gospel with him. Here's what I want to say to you. If you have a willing heart and you want to learn how to read the Word of God, if you want to learn how to grow spiritually mature, if you want to learn how to be effective in your spiritual life, God will provide a way for that to happen. That's why we're having this class. Now you need to know that I am just like you. I'm no different than you. People are like, well, the pastor, you know, he gets up every morning and eats manna. <laughs> and then he gets a phone call on his white phone from God. You know, and after he talks to God, he gets in his cloud and he floats to church. Are you kidding? I'm on the 215 too. I'm just like you. I'm just like you. I have to walk each day in fellowship with God. I have to watch my attitude. If I wasn't a Christian, I'd be a lawyer. (laughs) Enough said, all right? 
I have to be just like you. I have to grow in my walk, in my understanding. I have to be disciplined in my spiritual life. And it's an intentional thing that I have to do. So I was complaining to my wife. Now, I know none of you men ever complain to your wife. I know none of you wives ever complain to or about your husbands. But I was complaining to my wife. Because I was just saying, man, I, can't, I don't know which way I'm going. I've got so many things going on. And this was before she fell and broke her shoulder. And so now I'm bathing her and, and doing the wash and the dishes and all those things as well as studying and, and, and working and everything. So I was just like, I, I don't have any time to do anything. I, I got to prepare. I got nine pages of manuscript to 10 pages each Wednesday night. I have the same every Sunday morning. And those don't just poof come out of the air. I mean, you have to sit and study. And so I was complaining. <laughs> I know maybe that, that bust your bubble of who I am, but that's just me. I'm just real, okay? And my wife, in her grace-filled way, said, well, nobody told you to teach a Wednesday night class. <laughs> <laughs> Dummy. You know? But here's the thing. I said, I know, I know. But God put it on my heart to teach our people how to study and how to read the Word of God for themselves. Because the fact that you're here says that you have a willingness to be equipped. You have a desire to be equipped. And so God put it on my heart. He's like, hey, Calvin, knucklehead, go down there and teach that class. Yes, sir. I mean, I'm not the smartest person in the world, not the sharpest knife in the drawer, not the brightest bulb in the closet, but I do know how to do what I'm told. And as long as I can do that, as long as I can obey him, I'm good to go. Same with you. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room. You just have to be the one who listens and obeys. And so here I am teaching you, because why? Because God put it in your heart when you heard this class was being offered, going, I, I want to know how to do this. I want to know how to read the Word. I want to grow in my spiritual life. So the point is, God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the call. He's called you. Now He sent me to equip you. Well, what is the Word of God good for? It's profitable. That means effective, useful, beneficial, rewarding, the God-breathed Scripture is profitable on a number of levels for a variety of things Paul mentions for, for teaching. The primary purpose of Scripture is to teach us about God. In fact, the Scripture is God's self-revelation of Himself to His people. This word in Greek is used to talk about the teaching of proper Christian doctrine as opposed to falsehood. The Word of God teaches us who God is, teaches us truth, and how to separate truth from error, all error comes from people who are ignoring, twisting, or improperly handle, handling the Word of God. So Scripture reveals something about God to us. He has given it to us in order that we might learn about Him, and that as we learn about Him, we learn about ourselves, and we learn who He wants us to be. We learn about His character, His person, His call in our life, His purpose for us. He's given it to us so that we can learn what we could not learn from any other source. The Word of God is profitable for teaching. That is why when people say, I'm moving to another state, do you have a church for me to go to? I'm like, you know, I don't. I mean, sometimes I will know of a pastor or something, but most of the time I say to them, I don't care if you get in a Baptist church or an evangelical free church or a Bible church, get in a church where they teach the Word of God, where there is expository preaching taking place, where the pastor is opening the Word, he's reading the Word, and then he's sticking to what the Word says. Because we all know the different kinds of sermons. You know the spring, springboard sermon. I told you about that. You spring off the text and you never get back to it. You know the longhorn sermon, right? A point here and a point here and a lot of bull in between. <laughs> There's a lot of preachers that preach like that. They're not exposing the people to the Word of God. The Word of God is swift and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of the soul, the spirit, the bones and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's what Hebrews 4.12 says. So it's important that you attend a church where they teach the Word of God. You might not like the comfort of the pew. You might not like the color of the seat. You might not like the style of the music. But let me tell you something. You need to be in a church where they are preaching and teaching God's Word as inspired and authoritative and unchanging. That's the bottom line. It's profitable for teaching. It's profitable for reproof. 
No clapping in there, you know. <laughs> this is talking about a verbal rebuke with a view towards conviction of sin. Don't get me started. But I'm going to tell you what's missing from a lot of pulpits today is calling sin, sin. What's missing from a lot of churches today is calling people to conviction. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit of God convicts us of sin. And He does that when the Word of God is faithfully preached. But when you have a pastor that gets up and says, we're all messed up, it's okay to be messed up, let's have a group hug and sing kumbaya, you're not going to get convicted of sin. You're going to get bored. And you're going to get led astray. The Bible is given, and, and, and hear me at the same time, the pastor ought not to be uh, preaching hell, fire, and brimstone every week. Because that's not healthy either. I used to have a t-shirt, and it had dogs on the front, Dalmatians. And there was, it was a church. There was a Dalmatian preacher, dog, in the pulpit, and there were Dalmatians in the pew, and the caption said, Hellfire and Dalmatians. <laughs> That's not a healthy diet that you want. But when, the, when a pastor is preaching through the Word of God, faithfully going through a book of the Bible, there are going to come times when it says this is a sin, this is an abomination to God, this is wrong, this will send you to hell. The pastor needs to be faithful to preach that. And you need to be faithful to read that and understand that God is serious about sin. God's so serious about sin that He sent Jesus to die in order to buy us back from the penalty of our own sin. That's how serious God is about it. The Word of God reproves us. It is a corrective thing. It keeps us from walking into a buzzsaw. It, it says, whoa, you're heading the wrong way. Turn around. You know what turn around, the word for turn around is? Repent. Repent. It's also good for correction. If reproof is seen as negative, correction is a positive restoration of a person to an upright position or standing with God. Literally, it means to be set right with God. Psalm 119 says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed thereto according to thy word? With my whole heart have I sought thee, O let me not wander from thy commandment. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The word of God is corrective. It sets us back on course. It tells us you're going the wrong way, and then it points us the right way in which we're supposed to go. That's why we need it. I'm going to tell you, I've memorized a lot of Scripture. I've studied the Scripture in Hebrew. I've studied the Scripture in Greek. But i got to read it all the time because there's so many messages coming at me from my cell phone, from the television, from people texting me, from Instagram and, and, and Twitter and all the things, all the billboards, all the signs. There's so many messages that I am, am processing every day that I will forget. The old song says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. That's how we are. That's why we need the Bible. I mean, Paul over and over says, put them in remembrance of these things. You and I need to read the Word of God regularly so that we can receive the teaching so that we can receive the reproof as painful as it might be sometimes so that we can get back on the right course and then it says it's good for training in righteousness this is a very interesting word in the greek language it speaks about training it speaks about training in seven different ways training through correction training through punishment training through law, training through grace, training through authority, training through tribulation, and training through judgment. Here it's talking about training through authority. In other words, this word was used in classical Greek to describe the entire education a young person would be submitted to before they could be accepted in the community as an adult. They had to go through a prescribed course of training where they understood how to read, they understood mathematics, they understood culture, they understood law, they understood all of the social graces. And, and when they had finished that complete course, they would be considered an educated person. That's what this word is describing. The Word of God gives us a complete education. It fills in every part of, that's missing in our lives. That's why Paul says to the church at Ephesus in, in Acts, he says, 
I was faithful to teach to you the whole counsel of God's word. And that's why I believe the, the pastor you sit under, the church you go to, needs to be one where they preach against sin, where they preach about love, where they preach about spiritual gifts, they preach about tithing, they, they preach about worship, they preach about all the things that take place in a Christian's life. You need the whole counsel of God's Word. Not just every Sunday about how to have your best life now. Not just every Sunday about how bad you are. Not just every Sunday about, whoopee, we have a great celebration. I've had people come to me and say, Pastor, can we not have a sermon for several weeks and just have worship? Like, I'm going to resist the temptation to slap you. <laughs> because that, I'm just wondering if I slapped you, if the dumbness might come out of you. That's a dumb thing to say. Because listen to me, reading the Word of God, hearing the Word of God preached, that is worship. That's part of worship. Don't get me started. I, and please don't be offended if I say those things. I'm not going to slap anybody. You might. I, that's all right. That's between you and the police. I'm not going to slap anybody. Doesn't mean I don't want to. And, and, and listen to me. Scripture is not optional. It's essential if we're going to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. It's through Scripture that we learn what it means to be able to follow Jesus Christ. So we've talked about the importance of Scripture for growth, for maturity, for effectiveness. And then in chapter 3, Dr. Hendricks gives us some insights into how this book can be useful as we seek to become better students of God's Word. And his, his goal is that we would have an effective method, process, or technique to study the Word of God. I, uh, when I went to seminary to do my doctoral work, it was in expository preaching. So we studied biblical interpretation. We studied the structure and delivery of sermons. And I mean, I must have read upwards of 100 books uh, during my doctoral work. And I'm not talking, you know, C-Spot Run, Clifford the Red Dog books, okay? I, I'm talking books this thick that would put an insomniac to sleep. You know, the hermeneutical spiral. And it's like this thick, and you know, you're like... Where's my gun? You know, it's just terrible. It's, it, I mean, those were bored, but it was filled with knowledge and you had to get all of these things. It was just crazy. And so what happens is when you study that much, and then we had to write reports on all of these books and regurgitate those reports to our fellow students and stuff. And what happens is you begin to learn some things that you be, it retrains the way you think. So when I look at scripture, I might not look at it the same way you do. I'm looking for things that you're not looking for because I've been trained how to look at that Scripture. When I go to the doctor, he sees things I don't see. Why? Because he's trained to see things I don't see. I, I remember going to an art museum with, an, with a guy who was an art dealer, and I don't know how he saw some of those things because I didn't see them in there. It looked like a drunk monkey got up there and painted paint, you know, and they want 40 grand for this. I'm not so sure those things were really there. But you know what I'm saying is if you have the right education, you begin to see things that other people don't see, and it becomes second nature to you. So my son, I may have told you, just published a book on biblical uh, exegesis, and uh, he's a professor, and he's really smart, and he's smarter than me, and I, I have no problems with that. I want my kids to be smarter than me. It's a poor stock that doesn't increase in value, right? So I want, I want my kids to do better than me. But and so his expertise is Trinitarian theology. So he he has dug down deep on the person of Christ and and the economy of the Trinity and and what how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all relate to each other. And he's writing about that and publishing articles about that and delivering academic papers on this kind of stuff. So if I have any questions about the Trinity, guess who I'm calling? I'm calling my son. He's a smarty pants. You know, I just went to our little Baptist seminary. He went to St. Andrews in Scotland. Ooh. <laughs> but let me tell you something. He had to preach the other day. Who do you think he called? <laughs> He's calling Papa Bear. That's right. He's like, Dad, uh, I got to preach. You, could you help me outline this? <laughs> Because I, I have been trained to see it. That's my gift. That's, that's what I do. What, 
What a Bible study method does is it trains you how to look at the Scripture and how to read it differently, how to look at it differently, so you're looking for things that you weren't looking for before, right? That's what a Bible study method does. Now, as we work through this book, you're going to find, you should find a simple proven process for Bible study. You don't have to know Greek to gain from this. You just have to understand and read English. A a, a sense of self-confidence in your ability to handle Scripture. Like anything else, practice brings proficiency, and proficiency brings self-confidence. Did any of you all ever play that operation game when you were a kid and you had to take the little tweezers? I saw a thing online the other day where they were pouring essential oils into it, you know, and it's like, this is the new operation. You just pour essential oils. <laughs> I never could do that. I just, I mean, my hand was like, nye, nye, nye. you're going to die, dude. <laughs> I was just never good at that. But People who did it, then they did it all the time. They spent all their time. They learned how to do it, you know? And, and so I want a doctor whose hand is steady. I want a doctor operating on me. Well, first of all, I don't want any doctor operating on me. But if one has to, okay? I want one that is practiced and skilled, who has done enough operations. I don't want a guy that says, have you done this before? And he's like, well, we did it in lab. You know, I don't, I don't want that guy. I want the guy that says, yeah, I've been doing this for 30 years. You're my dude, okay? That's who I want operating on me. So you, the more you practice, the better you get, and it just becomes second nature. And then the joy of personal discovery. I mean, it's like learning anything else. When you, when, when, when you see others do it, that's one thing. But then when you learn to do it for yourself, you benefit from it on a different level. And then part of this this journey, this Bible study method that you, you should come up with, is a de- it should give you a deeper walk with God. It stands to reason that since Scripture is God's revelation of Himself to us, the better you are able to understand Scripture, the more you'll understand God, and the more you understand of Him, the more you know about how to relate to Him, who you are, who He is, and who He wants you to be. That's what you ought to get from this. But like anything else, You get out of it what you put into it. There's no magic pill for learning to speak a foreign language. You simply have to get out there and make mistakes and practice it. Fluency comes with persistence and practice. The same is true with Bible study. That's why he says, Scripture does not yield its fruit to the lazy. And and I heard one of my professors say that not all of the gems of God's Word are on the surface. Many of them you have to mine. You have to dig down for it, and you have to look at. You'll also need to be open to deepening your dependence on the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, but the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually apprised. But he who is spiritual apprises all things, yet he himself is apprised by no man. For who has known the mind of of the Lord that he should instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So Jesus tells us that he's going to send the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about that in a minute, who's going to help us understand. So to get the most out of the Bible study, you need to be right with God, the Holy Spirit, listening to what he has to say, following his lead. And as he speaks, he'll call you to, hold on, change. Don't read the Bible if you don't want to change. I never read the Bible that it doesn't call me to change. I've been a Christian for 55, 56 years. Grew up in a Christian home. Can't tell you how many courses I've taken, how many times I've read it, but every time I read it, there's something that the Holy Spirit says to me that's like, Calvin, you need to get this right, you need to change, because that's the process of the Holy Spirit working in my heart to continue to conform me to the image of Jesus Christ. So you got to be open to change. Now, chapter 4 gives us an overview of the process. We're going to jump through that real quick, and then we're going to get to the, 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 the chapter on observation. So he talks about several things. Observation, what do I see? Information, what does it say? Interpretation, what does it mean? Understanding, is what is the significance of this message? So you see the difference between what, is it, what do I see and what does it say, between what does it mean and what's the significance of this, and then how does it work? I mean, what's it calling for me to do? How is it, how is it calling me to change? What, what's, so there's the what, there's the so what, and there's the now what. You see? So this is what it says. So what? What does that mean to me? And then 
the now what, what, is it, what am I going to do? How am I going to put this into practice in my life? In fact, if you want, ever are called upon to teach a Bible study, that's a great outline for you. The what, the so what, and the now what. That's, that's a great way to look at every scripture. What is it saying? So what? What does that mean? What does it mean to me? And then, now what? What is it calling me to do? How am I supposed to respond to what the Scripture is saying? Under the topic of observation, he talks about key words. He talks about structure, grammatical structure, genre. We're going to talk more about biblical literary genre. But, but there are different types of literature in the Bible. Have you ever read Ezekiel? Is it easier to read Ezekiel than it is the 23rd Psalm? No. The 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leadeth me in paths. Of, it's so beautiful. The Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, blessed are they that hunger and thirst for You know, you are the salt of the earth, the, the similitudes. These are such beautiful passages, and you get in Ezekiel. And then there's this monster, and he's got five heads, and there's a wheel up in the sky, and you're like, what was he smoking? There are different genres of literature. And, and if you're going to understand them, you have to understand how to read that. You don't read a newspaper the same way you read a math textbook. They're different types of literature, and they have a different purpose. So in the Scripture, we have historical narrative, we have epistolary literature, we have gospel narrative, we have apocalyptic literature, we have wisdom literature, we have poetry, we have this wide range of prophetic literature, we have this wide range of different kinds of literary genres, and there are rules that are in effect. If you want a good book on that, it's called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. And there are rules to help you understand how to do that. And then interpretation, what does it mean? Uh, you'll have a lot of questions for the text. That's part of understanding. We've all experienced it. Someone tells us something, but they are vague. Don't you hate it when you tell someone something and they say, well, what, what do you mean by that? Well, it's always casting a doubt on your ability to effectively ask a question, right? What do you, I have a friend who's a seminary president, and I don't care what you ask him. It's like, well, what, do you, what, what exactly do you mean by that? Could you explain that? And, and by the time you've answered it, you've, you, you've answered the question for yourself, you know, because he's, he's asked you enough questions that you've just answered. I'm like, just, just answer me, you know? But when you come to the Scripture, you have to ask a lot of questions. What does this mean? Um, and then there are answers. They're there, but you'll have to look for them. Someone once said that, 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 that the answers are there, but they're not going to yield themselves to you if you don't ask the right questions. You have to ask the right questions of Scripture. Integration, you'll have to look at all the questions and all the answers and look for patterns, looking for overarching meanings. Hendricks says that integration is a stage where you reconstruct the meaning of the passage you've dissected to inspect the details. And he talks about reading, recording, reflecting. We'll call it rumination. Um, and so then he talks about application. How does it work? What does it mean for me? What does it mean for others? How does it work for me? How does it mean for others? And it, it, it's got to speak to me before it can speak through me. Now we're going to come to chapter 5. And, and so that's basically spent 45 minutes talking about what we should have talked about last time, but we didn't have time to. So we're going to talk about observation. What do I see? This question is of much greater importance than most people realize. I'm going to put something on the board up here. Uh, don't you hate these little things? They're in every doctor's office, all right? There's that little book that your kids are looking at, and you're looking at and thinking, I'm pretty dumb because I can't figure out what's different about these things. But there are 10 different things in these pictures, one from the other. Can you find them? The hat, the star, the hat has stripes. The star's not in the one on the right. The eyelashes are different. And so here's the thing. You're going to look at that for a while, and you're going to get nine of them, and you're going to say, there's only nine, there's only nine, there's nine. There's ten. So you have to keep looking. Miranda, put up the answers, would you? There we go. There's all the things that are different. Maybe you missed the three little dots down the bottom left. Uh, maybe you missed the heart that it's at the bottom of the, of the moon. Or the, the eyelashes on the moon's eye. Maybe you missed the, 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 the way that the, the circles are on the top of the teepee where they're full 
uh, on the left, they're black dots, and over here, they're circles. I mean, see, so observation is the thing that enables you to do that, but we don't really pay attention to things. When you went to the grocery store last time, there are 11. Well, and here's the, here's, the meta, here's the meta thing. The whole picture is different, so that's 12. <laughs> so think about it. How many things do you miss in your every day? When you went to the grocery store last time, we can get back to our text. When we went to, because they're going to be focused on that, Miranda. Get it off of there. Get, or, Terry, get it off of there, Terry. Oh, I'm still trying to find him. Yeah, no. When you went to the grocery store last time, who was the person in front of you when you were checking out? What did they look like? What was the name of the person that checked you out? What was the last time you... Tell me the color of your dentist's eyes. Guess what? We don't pay attention. We just don't pay attention. And there are a number of reasons we don't pay attention. One reason is we rely too heavily on technology to do the work for us. Our phones, our televisions, our computer screens, programs have made us lazy. Take, for instance, the word processing software I need to, to write all of these manuscripts. See, I don't have to be a perfect speller. I don't have to look up a word in the dictionary to find how it's spelled anymore. I just have to write it wrong, and the computer program will make it right. And so we get lazy. How many of you know all your children's phone numbers by heart? Yeah, a couple of you nerds. No, I'm not. My, my wife knows ours. I couldn't tell you all our kids' numbers. I got them on speed dial. We, we rely on technology. It's easier to rely on technology than it is to do the work for ourselves. Another reason we don't observe is we're just in too much of a hurry. I don't have time to look at the person at the grocery store. I don't have time to read the footnotes. I don't have time to see where the source is. I'm just in a hurry, and so I'm just scanning over things. Am I the only one that finds there's not enough time in the day to do everything you need to do? Somebody asked me if I was busy. I said, I just need an extra 15 hours. Just an extra 15 hours, and I might catch up with where I need to be. But that's not going to happen. It's like reading the Bible, reading any other book. Reading in a hurry keeps us from seeing important things in the text. And by the way, it's not just when we read that we don't pay attention. How many of you have been accused by your spouses of selective hearing? I I don't want to cause any marital fights, okay? But I know, experientially, I'm speaking out of experience, that selective hearing is a very real thing. We hear what we think is important, and what we don't think is important, we just don't hear. Because we're not paying attention. And so this becomes a pattern in our life. Another reason is we're preoccupied with other things. I don't know about you, but if, if, if I've got a big thing I'm working on, or I've got a big issue I'm dealing with, I can sit and read, and three pages later, I don't remember what I've read. Because my mind is wandering on other things. And, and that is so real. You come home from work and you're dealing with this thing or you've got family issues or you've got health issues or you've got a, some kind of thing that's looming over you and you sit down to read the Bible and all you can think about is that issue that you're dealing with and you're going to say, well, I did read a chapter. You don't know have a clue what that chapter said because you weren't paying attention to what that chapter said. You were thinking about your problem. We're not being observant. And when it comes to Scripture, one of the reasons we don't observe as we should is we fail to recognize the necessity of depending upon the Holy Spirit to help us understand. You see, when I went to college, I went to uh, a junior college for two years and then went to university at Baylor for two years, and they taught us the Bible as literature. So, it's just literature, it's just poetry, it's just like any other religious myth, religious text. That's what they say. 
And if we're not careful, we can get sucked into thinking that as I read the Bible, I just need to read it like I would read anything else and just try to approach it like I approach anything else. And there are certain rules that apply, and we're going to talk about that, about reading and how we observe. But there's something different about the Word of God. It is alive. It is powerful. And it is hidden from those who are not being instructed and led by the Holy Spirit. That's why a lost person can read the Bible, and it doesn't make sense to them. And you're like, how can you not see this? Because the Bible says in Ephesians 4, they are blinded by the life, from the life of God by the darkness that is in them. Jesus talked about the Pharisees. He said, they're the blind leading the blind. You cannot just pick up the Bible, read it, and understand it without the illuminative power of the Holy Spirit. And let me say this, if there's stuff in your life that isn't right, if there's sin in your life, if there's unforgiveness in your life, if there are things in your life that you should do that you're not doing or that you should not do that you are doing, then the Holy Spirit doesn't have control and you are going to have a mental block when it comes to Scripture. So unlike any other book, I just got, I mean, I I read books all the time, secular books. I love history, so I read a lot of history. I can read that without the Holy Spirit's intervention because a lost person could read that book and get the the essence of the book. But when I read the Scripture, I cannot read it without the Holy Spirit's insight, work in my heart to illuminate my heart, to open my dull brain and my blinded eyes and my prejudices and my preconceived ideas and put those beside me so that I can see the truth of what He is trying to tell me in His Word. That is why when you read the Bible, you have, and you want to get the most from it, you have to be right with God. That's just, that's just the truth. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. John 16, Jesus tells the disciples about the coming of the Holy Spirit, but when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own initiative, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will disclose to you what is to come. He shall glorify Me, and He shall take of Mine, and shall disclose it to you. All the things that the Father has given Me are Mine. Therefore I said that He takes of Mine and will disclose it to you. The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, will teach us all things and bring all things to our remembrance, whatever Christ has commanded. That is absolutely an un, unnegotiable reality in the Scripture. So observation takes time. It takes concentration. It takes intentionality. It takes patience. And in the case of the Holy Spirit, it takes the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. As the psalmist prayed, we should pray. I'm just going to tell you, when I'm studying the Scripture, when I'm preparing a sermon, here's one of my prayers. Lord, open my eyes to see. Open my ears to hear. Give me light. Give me understanding. I have to sit on that front pew every Sunday and and just make sure everything's right with God. Every Sunday. Because the Holy Spirit's not going to speak through an unclean vessel. And I don't want to get in the habit of relying upon my ability rather than upon His supernatural ability. And the same thing is true in your reading of the Bible. You can learn how to read it. You can learn how to to observe. You can learn how to interpret it. And then you think you've got it and you don't think you've got to be right with God and you will miss the heart of what God wants you to hear in the Scripture. So don't make that mistake. Let's real quickly take a look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts 1. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you know, Acts is a continuation in essence of Luke because Luke, the Gentile physician, is the human author of both the Gospel of Luke and Acts. Matthew is a book that is written primarily to Jews. Uh, Mark is probably the Gospel according to Peter, and Mark was his secretary or amanuensis. Luke is a physician, and he's a historian. He's sitting out, setting forth in a very Greek-oriented way, a very, uh, a very structured, logical way, which would have been the Greek mindset, to give you a history of what happened in the life of Jesus. And so as he 
picks up at the end of Luke, he picks up in Acts chapter 1, and this is what the Bible says. It says uh, in chapter 1, verse 4, gather them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but wait, but wait for, the, for, for the, what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized you with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they'd come together, <laughs> don't, don't, I love the disciples, man. I just love to pick on them because we're, we're like them, you know? He said, now just wait. The Holy Spirit's coming. Just wait where you are. The Holy Spirit's coming, okay? And they said, when they got together, they said, Lord, is it this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? It wasn't the kingdom of God. It wasn't a spiritual kingdom. It wasn't about the Holy Spirit's work. It's, you know, we've been waiting for this physical, material, martial, military, political kingdom. Are you going to do that now? Because they were so fixated on that that it didn't matter what Jesus told them. They already had their minds up what he was supposed to do. We just want to know if you're going to do what we want you to do now. And Jesus says, he said to them, it's not for you to know the times of the epics which the Father has fixed his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem, all Judea, and Samaria, even in the remotest parts of the world. Let's look at this verse real quick. The first word, but, what's that referring to? It's a conjunction of contrast. You said this, but I'm saying that. So there's a contrast between what they're saying. That's one of the first clues to being observant in that text. But what's the, what's the contrast? They wanted a political kingdom. He was offering them the Holy Spirit so that they could be active agents in his spiritual kingdom. But they didn't get that. Well, okay, that's what the word but refers to. What does it say about the priorities of the disciple versus the priorities of God? What does it say about our priorities versus God's priorities? You. But you. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the disciples. Who were the disciples? Who were they? Were they guys that, uh, you know, had studied the Scripture all their lives and had PhDs in Hebrew and Greek? No. They were simple fishermen. They were regular, hardworking, blue-collar guys with calluses on their hands. They were simple people that when the, when, when, at Pentecost, when they started speaking in other languages, the, 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 the Jewish leaders were amazed because these are uneducated men. Who are these people? Well, they're people just like you and me. When he says, but you, who's he talking to? Is he talking to just the disciples? Or is he also talking to you and me? See, those are questions that we have to ask of the text. You will. This points to a future event, to something that has not yet happened. When, when will it happen? From our knowledge of the rest of the book, when is this, what is this event that he's talking about? It's Pentecost, right? It's the coming of the Holy Spirit in chapter 2. You will receive. You will receive. This is the thing that they are going to experience. It's not something they can work for. It's not something they can merit. It's not something they can earn. It's not, as a lot of denominations would say, something you have to strain to get. You don't have to get strain to get the Holy Spirit. He says, you're just going to receive it. I, it's a gift. I'm going to send this down on you. You're, you're going to receive it. When you receive something, it's not something you worked for. It's just something that somebody gives you. That's right there in the text. You will receive what? Power. What's that? What kind of power is it? Am I going to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger? I'm here to pump you up, you know? Am I going to have that kind of power? We will twist you like a girly man. No, no, that's not what he's talking about. See, because there, when it says power, what kind of power is he talking about? We have to be specific. So those are questions that we have to ask of the text. What kind of power? You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Who's the Holy Spirit? The text opens up this whole can of worms. Now we have the third person of the Godhead mentioned. Jesus, the Son of God, resurrected, crucified, resurrected, not yet glorified, tells the disciples who have not yet received the Holy Spirit, who are hiding out in the upper room because they're afraid of the Jewish leaders, he says, no, you're not, and who are focused on a material military kingdom, he says, wait, 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 wait. It's not for you to know that. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Whoa, we've entered an entire new realm. 
Who is this Holy Spirit? What is his ministry? What does the Bible tell us? So when you're doing Bible study, when you're trying to understand what the Scripture says, what else does the Scripture say about receiving gifts from God? What else does the Scripture say about the Holy Spirit? What's his ministry? What's his purpose? How does he work? Who gets the Holy Spirit? When do you get the Holy Spirit? Those are questions that you have to ask of the text. And that drives you to look more into the Scripture to learn more about what Jesus is talking about. So I could take that text and preach five sermons on it because it's so packed with information. But a guy that never has preached before, he's going to preach an entire book of the Bible in about 20 minutes because he doesn't know how to observe. He doesn't know how to draw those things out of the text. He doesn't know what to look for. What I want you to do as you look at the Scripture is ask the questions of the text. What does but mean? What's the contrast? But who is you? What does it mean you will? What does it mean to receive? What kind of power are we talking about? Who's the Holy Spirit? Does every Christian receive the Holy Spirit? When you ask questions like this, you begin to understand more of what the Scripture is communicating to us when He comes upon you. What what does that mean? Is He going to jump me in the dark? I mean, that's a fair question. I mean, Nicodemus, Jesus says to him, you must be born again. Nicodemus is not filled with the Holy Spirit. Nicodemus isn't born again. And so he says, what, can a man enter his mother's womb a second time? He doesn't understand it. It's a spiritual thing, but he's not spiritual, so he can't understand it. So when you read this, you have the Holy Spirit living in you if you're a believer. Incidentally, the Bible says that at the moment of salvation, Ephesians 1, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit under the day of redemption. The Bible says in Romans that if any man hath not the Spirit of God, he is none of mine. So don't believe the charismatics when they say that you have to have a second blessing. That's not true. You got the Holy Spirit when you got saved. That's not the issue. The question is, does he have you? Those are things, doctrinal things, that you learn by asking the right questions. And what happens with error, what happens with heresy, what happens with false teaching is people will take a text out of context and they'll say, man, you've got to wait to receive the Holy Spirit. The disciples, they had to wait to receive. You have to wait. That's not what, that's not what the text says. They are imposing on the text something that the rest of Scripture does not stand up with. So, The best interpreter of Scripture, listen to me, the best interpreter of Scripture is other Scripture. So when you ask the questions of the Scripture, you have to let Scripture answer the questions that you're asking. You shall be witnesses unto me. What is a witness? Does it mean anything to you that the Greek word for witness is the same word from which we get the word martyr? Does that add anything to what it means to be a witness? You know, I hear a lot of people say, well, my life is my witness. Well, it should be, but I've never seen a pantomime in a witness stand. Can you tell us what you saw on the night of August 24th at 10 o'clock? Yeah, no. A witness is somebody who speaks what they have seen. Jesus says, you're going to receive a supernatural power when the third person of the of of the trinity when god himself comes upon you and fills you and you are going to be supernaturally charged and empowered to tell what you have seen and experienced about me wow well so does that mean that being a witness is optional It's something I can take under consideration. It's something that I can pick and choose. Well, you know what? I don't feel like much of a witness today, so I don't think I'm going to win. Or is this something that is incumbent upon every Christian that is filled with the Holy Spirit, every Christian that says, I'm a follower of Christ? You see, those are the questions you ask the text. And when you you honestly ask the text those questions, you get very uncomfortable answers back. Can I suggest to you that a lot of people don't want to ask questions of the text because they don't want the answer? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, 
and the uttermost parts of the world. This points to specific places and then all places. The gospel is going to start where they are and it's going to move out from there. What does that say to you and me? What, how does that inform our missionary strategy? I served a church one time and they could care less about the people down the street. All they were focused on was the people in other countries. We just got to go overseas. We got to go overseas. We got to go overseas. We got to go overseas. Hey, listen, the gospel worth taking around the, the, the world is worth taking around the corner. The missionary strategy that Jesus outlines in Acts chapter 1 is that you start, you bloom where you're planted. The light that shines furthest shines brightest at home. You learn that just from this text. So if you're not sharing the gospel where you live, then don't waste your time going to some foreign country because you want an expense-paid vacation. If you really want to share the gospel... I can take you down to the strip. If you really want to share the... And that's another world right there. But I You might as well be in a foreign country. Asking the right questions is important. Chapter 7 deals with reading. And I, I'm going I'm to finish here in a, a few minutes, and then we're going to have a time of question and answer. Reading is very important. There are any number of books out there that the purpose of which is to help you be a better reader. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I wonder if I did ask you, how many people here could say they had read a book on how to read a book? You're working on it, on, on Mortimer Adler's book. There are other books that are probably a little shorter, but most of us don't really think about reading. We learned how to read in elementary school, and we learned how to read in high school. But listen, my son's a seminary professor, and he tells me, Dad, I've got guys coming to their master's degree, and they don't know how to read. In his Systematic Theology 101 course, he assigns them between 700 and 1,000 pages to read. I, I texted him today. I said, Tyler, how many pages do you assign? And he said, between 700 and 1,000, depending on the difficulty of the book. The less difficult, the more pages. The more difficult, the less pages. And I texted him back and said, I am sure I would have learned from your course, but I would not have enjoyed it. <laughs> He's old school, man. He... he so here in the United States, our education system, <laughs> I'm just going to stop there because Johnny can't read. He's not been taught how to read. Our education system is let's get you through this step and this step and this step and this step. When I did my doctorate at Southern Seminary, we had this seminar, we wrote this number of papers. We had the next seminar, we wrote this number of papers. We had the next seminar, we wrote this number of papers. Then we had to write our dissertation or our project, and then we had an oral defense. But it was all built up, one step to another step to another step, and we're going to get you through. Tyler goes to St. Andrews, and there are no classes. He meets with his professor every three months, and the professor says, what are you reading? What do you have any questions for me? After four years of reading and studying, he has a full day of oral interviews over his dissertation that he's had to write. You don't get an A, you don't get a B, you don't get a C, you don't get a D. It's pass or fail. And he said, Dad, there were people who spent $50,000 and four years of their life, and they failed. Because they didn't read. So he became a bookworm. All he did was read. Read, 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 read. He had to learn how to study. So now he, he, he wants his students to learn how to read. We have to learn how to read. We have to learn how to read for information, how to read for understanding, how to read for pleasure. We have to learn how to read. That's why I've been going back through how to, how to read a book. What Hendricks covers in chapter 7 is kind of a view of the book. He comes to tell us that we need to have a, the ability to read a book at different levels. We can read it as an overview. We, sh we could learn how to skim it. We could learn how to see what the major points are. Most of us don't do that. We pick up a book. We start reading the first chapter about halfway in. We're going, eh, this is boring. 
When in reality, the first chapter is just setting up the really good parts of the rest of the book. But if we had read the table of contents, we had read the preface, we understood something about the author, where he was coming from, what his perspective was. I'm a Lord of the Rings fan. Anybody a Lord of the Rings fan in here? All right, sorry. Some of you are educated. Um, I've read the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy six times. And I'm ashamed of that because I could have been reading Greek and stuff. But I, I just, I was reading the Lord of the Rings. And I love it. And so... I want to know about the author. I want to know what his perspective was. I want to know what his influences were. The same things I want to know about this, I should be wanting to know about Scripture. Who's the author of Ezekiel? Who is Ezekiel? Who's the author of of Jeremiah? Who's Jeremiah? What's his life? What's his perspective? You see, we ought to be asking these kinds of questions of the text. We ought to have that interest. And here's what he comes to, and we'll stop with this and then we'll have a couple questions. He says, we need to read the Bible like a love letter. We've been, you know, we just moved into our house a few months ago. And have you ever known you moved and your wife said, we got to get, we gotta get rid of junk. Can I get a witness today? Well, let's translate that. Your stuff's junk? <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, she's fair. She's, she's gotten rid of, so she'll throw things away. I mean, she has no problem with that. But anyways, I was going through some old papers. I have this box. You have a box that's got all your old stuff in it from when you were a kid, you know? So I, I have this box. It's an old cigar box. I've had it since high school, and it's got my first driver's license in it. It's got a, a, a little charm my first girlfriend gave me. It's got a couple bullets in it. It's I'm from Texas, okay? I mean, it's it's got... I used to be a reserve deputy constable, so it's got my badge in it and just old stuff. And I was going through there thinking, eh, do I want to get rid of this stuff? I've hauled it all over the world. You know, this is time to get rid of it, you know. And I came across this folded up crumpled piece of paper that was yellow. And I could see through the kind of onion skin paper that it was handwritten. And I'm like, I wonder what this is. And so I open it up, and it's dated 1970. Seven, and it's from my grandfather to me. If I had ever read it when I was eighteen years old, I had I had no recollection of it. In fact, I was already in the Navy when he wrote it to me. Uh, I went to boot camp in the fall of 1977, and he wrote it to me when I was in boot camp and got this letter from him. My grandfather was an evangelist. He was a vocational evangelist. He was friends with a preacher named Billy Sunday. I have in my office a letter from Billy Sunday to my grandfather. I have one of Billy Sunday's sermons that he preached. I grew up with just idolizing my grandfather because he was a preacher. In the 20s, 30s, and 40s, he had tent revivals and tabernacles all over the country. And so I just kind of, he died when I was, he died about four years after he wrote me that letter. I was like 21. And I read the letter. And he tells me about when he got saved. And he tells me, I hear my grandson Calvin's going to be a preacher. And he says, I am praying that God will use you to bring more people to Jesus than he used me to. I am praying that he will use you mightily. Let me tell you something. I don't read that letter the same way I read a newspaper. That letter's precious to me. I have it in a very special place at home. I'll keep it the rest of my life. I'm going to go back and read it again. Isn't that how we should read the Bible? Isn't that how precious God's word should be to us? He has given us his word because he has some words of encouragement for us. He has some words of love for us. He has some words of hope for us. He has some words of correction for us. He has some words of direction for us. But if you don't read it like I read that letter from my grandfather, you're not going to appreciate it for what it is. When you read the Bible like a love letter, you'll start seeing things you've never seen before. And I love you guys. Thank you for coming tonight.
Um, we've just got about 10 minutes here. Anybody got any questions? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, how are we supposed to read how to read the the uh, 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 how to read a book? Well, I don't expect you to read that book. There are other. My, I, I was texting with my son about that, and he said, "Yeah, there are better books that are shorter that cover the same material." So next week, I'll have the name of one of those shorter books for you on how to read a book, okay? We'll get the cliff note version, and, and we'll figure out that. I mean, I'm working my way through it with a, you know, with a pen and, and a highlighter. I'm like, <laughs> so I get you. I get you. Yeah, I know. So don't, don't worry about reading anything other than the book that we're studying right now. If you want to Follow up on some of the other things in the bibliography, you can, but I would really focus right now on just understanding what he's talking about. Next week, we're going to talk about reading prayerfully, reading, you know, uh, observantly. I, I, there's a whole list of them. We're going to cover uh, the, the next chapters 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 next week. They're really short. There's just a couple of pages to each chapter. Yes, ma'am. Did, you, did I misunderstand? Um, are you going to be having your manuscript? I'm going to have my manuscript online. So, there's going to be a video online of our teaching, and then my manuscript that I print, I will give it to the office tomorrow, and they will put that online so that you can download it if you've missed anything that I've said, okay? It's on YouTube, yeah. It, it's easy to download. Any other questions? And, 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 and I'll be glad to answer. Yes, ma'am. How a verse interprets a verse. Yes, absolutely. That's a great question. So, Jesus says... Let me think about this. How a verse interprets... So, when he says you will receive the Holy Spirit, this is the one we talked about. What does it mean to receive the Holy Spirit? Well, I have some charismatic brethren who say you have to pray through to get the Holy Spirit. So you have to pray through to get the second blessing. I've had them tell me, I'll pray with you, but you're going to have to pray all night. You're going to have to beg God for the Holy Spirit. Well, then I go over to Ephesians chapter 1, and it says, the Holy Spirit of God with, by whom you are sealed under the day of redemption. That seal. So in my library, I have a little crimp tool, and it, 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 you crimp the front of the book, and it says, Property of Calvin R. Whitman. In other words, keep your mitts off. This is mine. That's the word that the, the Bible is using when it says we are sealed with the Holy Spirit under the day of redemption. God has put his stamp of ownership, and his stamp of ownership on us is the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus says you will receive power after the Holy Spirit's come upon you, we know that we receive the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. That's how one scripture informs another scripture and teaches us that those who think you have to pray through to get a second blessing are not being biblical. That's not what the scripture says. They're taking a verse out of context. Because remember, the book of Acts is not a book of systematic theology. It is a record. It's a historical narrative of the, book, of, of the Acts of the Apostles. So Peter comes and says, have you all received the Holy Spirit? And they don't know. We've never heard of the Holy Spirit. Well, that doesn't mean they needed to pray through for the Holy Spirit. They didn't understand really what it meant to be saved. They had heard something about the gospel, but they hadn't gotten the real message. There was no scripture for them to read. They had heard about this Jesus, and so he proceeds to preach to them the gospel, and they're, they're filled with the Holy Spirit because they get saved. That's how scripture interprets scripture. Other question. We got seven minutes. Yes, sir. So he's asking, how did the Gospels come to be? Was it word of mouth? Was it... So the liberals have come up with what's called a source document theory. We talked about that a little bit last week. The source document theory says that there was a common source and all of the, of the writers of the Gospels copied from that same source. Now, in the case of the higher critics, the liberals, they call that source Q. Here's the problem. Nobody's ever found that source. Nobody's ever found a fragment of that source. Nobody's ever found anything proving that there ever was a source document. So the Bible tells us that the Word of God came about when the Spirit of God spoke to men and caused them to write it. 
So they were all observers. If you and I go to a restaurant and they have somebody up there doing a flamingo dance, all right, doing the dance, and we sit there and we eat our food and we see them do the flamingo dance, and then we come back home and, and, and somebody says, well, would you write down for me what you saw? I'm going to write down, yeah, there was this flamingo dance, and they, had, they must have had metal on the bottom of their shoes because it sounded clickety-clickety-click. And Alfonso's going to write, yeah, they were wearing red, you know, because we notice different things. The, 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 three, the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called synoptic Gospels. So synonymous and optic, synoptic. They cover the same material, and it means, synoptic means as having been seen through the same eye. The Gospel of John is called the fourth Gospel because it doesn't follow the same trajectory and cover the same things that the first three Gospels cover. So, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Luke tells us in the first of his book that he's going out and he's interviewing eyewitnesses, and he's saying, tell me what happened, tell me what happened. I don't have any problem believing that he talked to Matthew, or that he talked to Peter, or he talked to some of the disciples, but the Holy Spirit still told him what to write. So there was no source document. The Gospels came about as God spoke to men, and they wrote what he told them to write. Some of them just, the, the Gospel of John, Paul sa- or, uh, John says, I have written these things that you might believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God, and believing in His name, you might have eternal life. He tells us the reason he wrote this was so that people would believe. Luke says, I've written these things so that you will have an accurate record of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. They have different purposes. Matthew's gospel is written to Jews. Mark's gospel is kind of like the gospel ADD, because (laughs) seriously... The Greek word kai, K-A-I, is the word and, and it is used like, I don't know, 90 times in the gospel of of Mark. And then this happened, and then that happened, and then this, and it's just like bang, 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 bang. And that's Peter. Peter's like on steroids, you know, squirrel, you know, that's Peter. I love Peter. And then Luke is just this very scholarly, articulate historian. and, and, And Luke's gospel is written to Gentiles, and Matthew's gospel is written to Jews, and John's gospel is written to everyone so that they can believe. Okay, so there are books on that, and I can share some information that will give you a little bit more about the, 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 the background of how the gospels came to be, but that's kind of a summary. Any other questions? Now's your shot. Yes, ma'am. Luke wrote the book of Acts. It's a continuation of his historical perspective on the, the ministry of Jesus, and now the ministry of the, of the apostles. All right? One more question. Who has it? Burning up. Yes, ma'am. Where are my notes on the website? Jane, do you have an answer to that? Do you know where my... It's on YouTube. If you will call the church office, I'm serious. People ask me things I have no idea. If you will call the church office and ask to talk to Miranda, she handles all that. She puts that up online. She's doing uh, our children's ministry tonight. But if you will call her and say, hey, I'm looking for this, she'll say, what's your email? I'll send you a link and she'll hook you up. Okay? I love y'all. Thanks for letting me teach this. We'll come again on Sunday. I'll see you then. God bless you.